Hello everyone, welcome back to Dare Game Cuts. So the problems for the APMO2025 have finally been released. In this video, we'll be taking a look at problem 3, which is a really interesting problem, and hopefully you will also learn something, because solving this problem requires knowledge of a theorem that isn't really quite commonly seen these days. In fact, I don't think I've seen this theorem being mentioned in about 10 years. So, Without further ado, let us take a look at this problem statement. So the problem is a number theory one and it's quite interesting. Let Px be a non-constant polynomial with integer coefficients such that P0 is not equal to 0. Let A1, A2, A3 dot dot be an infinite sequence of integers such that Pi minus j divides Ai minus Aj for all distinct positive integers ij. Prove that the sequence a1, a2, a3 dot dot must in fact be a constant sequence. Okay, let's begin with some exploration and hopefully that helps you to digest the problem statement a bit as well. So basically what this is saying is that you have a sequence over here and whenever you look at two terms that have the index differ by a number, let's say a3 and a6 here, the indices differ by 3, so p3 will divide the value a6 minus a3. See over here, if we have 3 and 6, or rather 6 and 3 in this instance, then p of 6 minus 3, which is 3, divides a6 minus a3. And similarly, let's say you look at a2 and a4, this is saying that p2 must divide the difference. And then if you look at, for example, a1 and a5, then p4 must divide the difference in the value. And if this property holds all for all pairs i, j, then actually this sequence must be a constant. That's what you need to prove. Now right off the bat, uh, we are going to make two observations to simplify the problem statement further. So firstly, notice that only the relative difference between value matters, not the absolute value itself. So what we can do is we can shift the sequence and have sequence up and down in value, let's say plus 1 to everything or minus 1 to everything. It will still have this property holding. So we can, without loss of generality, shift the sequence up and up or down so that the first term is equal to 0. Basically, subtract a1 from the entire sequence. It won't change the relative differences between terms. And the other simplified observation we can make is that actually I only care about relative differences in index. So I'm just going to re-index or renumber my sequence so that it starts at index 0. So these two uh, observations will help me uh, get much cleaner notation later on. So let's go ahead and do that change. So what we have now instead is the following. We have the same thing, polynomial, integer coefficients, p0 not 0, then my sequence starts from a0 instead, and a0 is equal to 0. I still have this special property that I need to prove, and to prove that the sequence is constant, basically I just need to show that the rest of the term is actually equal to 0. Okay, now enough of just fidgeting with the notation, let's do some actual exploration. With this notation, one advantage is that, well, if you look at any integer n, by definition of this property, pn must divide a n minus a0. But because a0 is assumed to be 0 here, we have a very uh, clean notation here, pn divides a n for every n. Now, the thing is, you can roll this further. Uh, if you now look at 2n versus n, again, the gap in the index is n, so pn also divides this difference. And because a n you already know is divisible by pn, so this tells us that pn divides a to n. And you can continue rolling this forward by taking a gap of n again to a 3 n, to a 4 n and so on. So pn basically divides a k n for all integer k. What we have pictorially is like this, all the yellow spots uh, my a n, a 2 n and so on, all these yellow spots are divisible by p n. Okay, can we stretch this to cover the other spots that are currently not uh, in yellow? 
I guess if we can do that, it will actually help impose a lot of constraints on the sequence. Well, it turns out that looking at PN is a bit too strong. Instead, let's look at a prime that divides PN. Okay, for a start, at least if P divides PN, P also divides all these things here. So all the yellow spots is still divisible by P. Working with a prime number give us more control than just looking at an arbitrary number that could be composite or prime. Okay, and of course, Pn in this case could be 1, uh, it could be 0, or, so I'm just, for exploration purposes, assume Pn is some number bigger than 1, so that I can find a prime that divides it. Okay, so suppose we have some prime that divides Pn, then let's look at P of n plus p. Why do we want to do this? Because we want to go past just the yellow markers. We want to look at the things in between. And adding gaps of p could potentially achieve this. So if you look at p of n plus c, what we notice is that, okay, if your polynomial is ci times x to the i, you plug in n plus p, look at the bi binomial expansion of this. If you expand this, all the powers of n part will collect together to form pn. You see? Because you have ci n to the i added together is pn. And then all the other terms in the binomial uh, expansion are all multiples of p. So you collect all of them together, you still get another multiple of p. So what this means is that if p divides pn, p obviously divides this multiple of p, then p will divide p of n plus p. And in fact, you can plug in any uh, multiple of p here. You can put a lp. L can even be negative integer or zero. You put in any LP, same thing, this will be LP. If you look at the expansion, this will come out as a multiple of P still. So P in fact divides polynomial evaluated at N plus LP, where L is any integer. This is fantastic news because now if we look at any of these yellow spots, uh, which is already we know P divides them, we can look at a gap n plus lp, then uh, that gap, right, the difference is divisible by this polynomial value, which is divisible by p. And since the yellow spot itself is divisible by p, the n point is also divisible by p. So we can take a step up by n and then go by any number of multiples of p, even negative, and all those uh, spots that we hit are all going to be divisible by the prime p. That is really wonderful because what we now know is that all a subscript kn plus lp is divisible by p. Now there's this small annoying thing here where k is uh, not just any integer but bigger than or equal to 1 because you start from uh, one some multiples of n and then you need to take one step of n forward first before you take any multiple of uh, p. So you do have to be slightly careful about this, but not to worry because if the GCD of n and p is equals to 1, you can show that uh, no, as k and l vary in their allowed range, this will cover basically every index. So this tells us that you know, every term in the sequence is going to be divisible by p. So then the question becomes, wow, everything is divisible by p, that's crazy. Can we do this for infinitely many p's? If you can do that, then certainly this forces the value of every term to be zero. So then we are forced to now look at this thing. Can we find infinitely many p and such that we can apply this whole logic? We, and to do that, we need p divide polynomial evaluated at n and the GCD of p comma n equals to one. So hopefully this motivation is crystal clear because once you reach this stage, you basically have the solution already. And you might be wondering, is this even true? This doesn't sound very trivial. Well, it turns out that there is a theorem that states precisely this. So there is something called Schur's theorem and uh, the statement goes as follows. Let capital P be a non-constant polynomial with integer coefficients then there exists infinitely many primes p such that p divides capital p n for some n positive integers. 
yeah, this is, uh, in fact, it's slightly different from what we mentioned earlier. There's no GCDP common N, but we'll address that in a moment. For now, this is a known theorem called Scher's theorem. And you might be wondering, is this uh, something that is supposed to be obvious? Well, it's not that obvious. We will prove this later, but you can quote this in the Olympiad and it's perfectly fine. Uh, so let's assume that we already know this. Uh, statement. In fact, we only know, need to know this for the cases where the polynomial satisfies p0 not equal to 0. And see how we can finish the proof. Uh, the good or bad thing is that with this theorem, the proof becomes basically trivial. Okay, so first thing is to remedy the GCD p, n thing. And it's quite easy to remedy this. Now, what we do is, we there's infinitely many such p's, right? That divides a a, a term in the, the polynomial uh, output. Uh, we take any p such that p is bigger than p0. And what we do is, okay, uh, by assumption, there's some n such that p divides pn. But I still don't know that p gcd p of n is equal to 1 yet. But this is very easy to show. If p divides n on the contrary, assume on the contrary, then Think about how the polynomial looks like. The polynomial is sum of uh, this part. Uh, when you plug in n, the polynomial will be ci n to the i. If p divides n, it will divide all the ci n to the i except for the constant term. So this means that p must also divide the constant term. But p is larger than my constant term. Uh, okay, I, I need to put the absolute value here, but let's say I have the absolute value. So I choose p size larger than the absolute value of this. Then this is impossible. <laughs> Your prime is larger than the absolute value of the thing. It cannot divide that thing. So this original assumption was false. p doesn't divide n. Oh, very good. Now we are basically back to the situation of what we saw during the exploration phase. So note that p divides uh all the a k n because the difference in index here is n so this difference is divisible by p n and p divides that then you roll forward another difference of n in the index and so on then at the same time we saw that p actually divides capital p n plus l p for any integer l to prove this again you plug in n plus l p uh, look at the binomial expansion. I don't think I need to iterate that further again. And what this implies is that then p divides a k n plus l p for any k greater than equal one and l an integer. And this means p divides a i for all i. And since this holds for infinitely many primes p, a i equals zero for all i. Yeah. So the proof is extremely, extremely short and easy to motivate. So this comes down to the question, is Schur's theorem itself actually trivial? Um, the proof is not that trivial. In fact, I think the proof of Schur's theorem itself is harder than the original problem. Uh, but there is a pretty elegant proof. So let's take a look at the elegant proof of Schur's theorem. Now, uh, one caveat, we will only prove this with the added assumption that p0 is not equal to 0, because that's all we need. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to see how you can reduce this general statement to the case we have uh, we are going to prove whereby p0 is not equal to 0. Okay, and some notation, I'm going to let c0 be the absolute value of p0. So you'll see this weird plus minus all over the place, and that's because I want c0 to be positive, so that uh, I get a cleaner notation later on. Okay, so my polynomial is going to look like this with the coefficients being marked by C and C0 because I want it to be positive, there's a weird plus minus here. Okay, now assume on the contrary, classic move, assume on the contrary that among all these Pn, the only prime factors that uh, show up there's only finitely many of them. So P1 to PR and derive a contradiction. Classic move again, we consider 
n defined by the product of all the primes, but I'm also going to need to put in c0 into my product. So because I make c0 positive, this thing will be positive. Okay, then now let's look at pn. But I'm in fact going to look at p evaluated at n to the m, where m is some positive integer. The reason for that will be clear shortly. But this is just plugging in at the moment. So I plug in the value of n. And what we see is that there's c0 appearing in all the terms. Yeah, so I can extract out a common factor of c0. This is why I put c0 inside here. So by taking out c0, I just basically have this thing. But the crucial thing is we now have a plus minus 1 here. Whereas all the other terms have p1 to pr in them. This means that uh, p1 to pr cannot be a factor of this thing in the bracket. So as long as this thing in the bracket has absolute value bigger than 1, there must be a new prime factor outside of p1 to pr, which gives a contradiction. But you might ask, how do I know if this absolute value is bigger than 1? Well, you don't, but I have this relationship holding for every m. So there's infinitely many m. As I vary all of them, it is not possible for infinitely many of them to have p evaluate to c0, minus c0, or 0. So therefore, there must be infinitely many possibilities of m outside of that for which this absolute value is indeed more than 1. So we got our desired contradiction and proved search theorem. Okay, so that's all for this problem. What do you think of this problem? I find it a bit weird because knowing the theorem is like basically the hardest part of the problem. And if you don't know the theorem, you are in for a very tough time. If you know the theorem, you are in for a trivial time. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. And Stay tuned to the channel and see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.